It's refreshment time, folks. Have to return some videotapes. Are either one of these any good? I don't watch movies. Do you like scary movies, Sydney? You have a TV? No. I just like to read the TV guide. Read the TV guide. Don't need a TV. Books, records, films, these things matter. Call me shallow. It's the fucking truth. Over 1,600 titles. Each for rent at just $2 the first night and only a... I don't watch TV. Yeah, but you are aware that there's an invention called television, and on this invention they show shows, right? Tonight on Six Ed World. Okay, I want channels 18, 24, 63, 187, and why the channel? Welcome to the Frog Brothers Podcast with your hosts, Justin and Alec. Hello, true believers, and welcome to episode 50 of the Frog Brothers Podcast. Excelsior. I was hoping you'd do that. Ooh, I 50. am Justin. With and me I'm Alec. Is Alec, and then you will be hearing, if you are on the video stream, the voice of Nick, who Hello. is uh, in Colombia, uh, doing cocaine. Hey, fuck your okay. Zan, okay? Fuck me. Fuck me. Fuck you. We had to drop the f bombs almost immediately. You don't so. say nothing about no kids, huh? Anybody seen Scarface, or is it just me? I think it's us. I have. Cool. So we got a little show and tell to start off, but we're going to do some more videos on these later. But uh, I found the two-pack Toonie Tears of Chucky and Tiffany from Bride of Chucky. So that's oh, they have a, a two-pack of that. They have a two-pack of that in the Toonie Tears. Uh, found that today. Yeah, I opened up that up on the live stream on Facebook last summer, if you saw that or didn't. I also got oh. a uh, NECA Batarang tonight, finally. So uh, look for a little review on that coming soon, too. It's, it's, uh, it's adorable. Finally found one in the stores. Adorable. It is. It's and uh, last but certainly not least, I found the uh, Battle of the Bands Auditions Marty. So, the Well, box... to, be, to be fair, I found this. Because you didn't even see it. You saw the Batarang and then just... Or actually, I think you saw the Grady twins, the shining Grady twins, and you were like, oh, because we just hadn't seen them yet. Yeah, they were right next to it. Anyhow. But it's just like, how is, yeah, it just doesn't stick out. You know what I mean? Like, seeing that, you're just kind of like, I don't know. The last two covers for these uh, Back to the Future line, the uh, Doc Brown cover and the uh, Audition Marty cover, just kind of, they're not the greatest. No. Necky usually does a better job. I mean, they're very in-universe with everything, but they just don't stand out from a collector standpoint. Yeah. So did we uh, we get that one pretty quick for old Missouri here? The audition Marty one. I haven't uh, seen a lot of people talking about finding those yeah, anywhere else. I mean, I've, been, I've seen a couple people, but also NECA uh, today posted something about how they were shipping out. They're about to ship out on their calendar schedule. So I don't know if that was. You never you know. know with some of this stuff. I mean, it's just all supply chain distribution. So if Walmart got it from there. Yeah distribution centers and then shipped it out i mean it shows up like i was at a different walmart a couple days ago and they didn't have anything yet and then tonight they had a bunch of those so if you're in the kansas city area and you're looking for one there were three or four of those probably left at the lee summit walmart so but that's the uh that's the good stuff there uh what's there going on in the world of news anything in the news gentlemen um not much we did find out there's Happy a Gilmore nine... too. Yeah, I don't think that's really going to happen. I think they're just saying it would. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. They just recorded that video, him and uh, old McDonald, or what's what's his name? Shooter McGavin's actor. Uh, yeah, but they also did like a uh, Back to the Future reunion on Josh Gad's channel. It doesn't mean Back to the Future 4 is happening. Yeah. Yeah, just because somebody said something, they're open to the idea. It doesn't mean someone's going to actually finance it and make it happen. It so. also doesn't mean it should happen. No. Because, yeah, I mean, should. while nostalgia is fine and all. I mean, they could do, in theory, it sounds funny, those two being on the senior PGA Tour and still being a bunch oh, of idiots yeah. or something. But in reality, we've yeah. seen Adam Sandler's comedy style be so family friendly. I just think it would lose the edge that he used to have if they did that well so. if you did it you'd almost have to put them on a team together for a golf tournament or something so that way they're fighting the whole time or something dumb 
Yeah. And it still probably wouldn't be very good. It'd be like Caddyshack 2. And the only acceptable cameo in place of Bob Barker would be Bill Murray or Brian Doyle Murray, since they're actually golfers. That yeah. would be a fucking Some Caddyshack requirement. references in there would be fun. Hell yeah. I mean, exactly. Netflix is fun in all of his crap, so they might actually do it. Who knows? Yeah, we'll see. That is an interesting concept, so... That's about the only thing I've heard of. That, that was new to me just now, too, so... Yeah, and then WandaVision has an episode 9. I think a lot of us expected it to end on 8. Nine's kind of a strange number of episodes for a yeah, limited so series, thought. but... Oh, well. There's well, people saying there's still going to be 10, but I don't know. I mean, it's possible at this point. I don't. It seems like know. there's a lot to wrap up, but... Well, yeah, and they keep doing... They just introduced and told you who some of the villains were in these last... Right. Specifically, these last two episodes. And then we got our uh, white vision at the end. Yeah, I or thought that was yeah. kind of... Was it mid-credits or... Which, um... Which we can talk about that, I guess, during the... We'll get to that. I think we should. Water I think just jump right I into think, it. Let's go there. Come, 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 come. Makes me want to touch my titties. Right, Charles, yeah. So that was weird if you're watching the video. I'm sorry you had to see that, but hey, yeah. we do what we want around here. May as well. You only live once. Unless uh, you're like Vision and you get brought back from the dead. But that's uh, so epi- fiction. Episode 8. Previously on is the title. Yep. Mm. I did like how this episode started out immediately with this uh, witch trial, the Salem witch trials in 1693. Mm. That was pretty cool. And Athica, or Agatha, Agatha, I can't even fucking read or write or talk. <laughs> Don't mind me over here, ladies and gentlemen. I'm a fucking idiot. Uh, Agatha is absorbing the other witch's powers as they try to destroy her, which is pretty badass. So I'm assuming that's how she becomes so strong, because she's just over there like, yeah, you like that, don't you? And you're like, geez, mm-hmm. dude. Did my voice crack? Mm-hmm. Oh, I didn't know that. I just stuttered over something I didn't stupid. Notice either. No, I did. The the viewers, if you if you want to argue with that that's not a voice crack, I mean, you can leave a comment or something, but I, I think it qualified, so listen back. We have the tape. <laughs> we'll uh, ask in... Our experts, uh, Nathan and Edgar, to weigh in on their We opinion. need a poll. We should put up a poll somewhere for that. And then uh, strip on it. I mean, yeah, we can get weird anytime, day or night. So this this episode really took a dive in terms of like excitement and build-up. Well, yeah, it's kind of like showing you what you already know. but it's That's what I was telling Justin. It's just you. too much too late. Like, I don't care about this. Like, I've known about Scarlet Witch's origins and been able to see enough about it in the last seven years that I don't need that, personally. Yeah, it just seemed like too much too late, and it's just part of the way the show's edited, and it's not anything against the writing. It's just the way it's been pieced together so we consume it. And, you know, comic books kind of break things out like that, and we're used to it because Tarantino's done it, but I just don't think the way this is done has been... Yeah. Top notch for me. It's it's good, above average, but it's not amazing in some of these things. Like episode four, I think it was, when we realized we finally got outside the walls to see what was going on. And then this episode really feel like we should have been getting glimpses of this throughout, kind of scattered as things go along. Well, here's one thing, though. While we're getting all negative, I will say one thing about this episode that I liked when it was doing all these annoying ass flashbacks. Um, it showed that Wanda did not steal Vision's body. Yeah, which is obviously why they still have it. So Hayward was lying and manipulating his own agents, aka Monica Rambo, to do fucked up shit. Which basically tells me that he is a villain. Yes, he's he's going to be someone to be dealt with internally, right? And it's not uncommon to have villains within Shield or right sword, or and anything, he's not necessarily right? like a Hydra type villain or anything like that. He thinks he's doing the right thing, so he's a, he's a more interesting type of villain for sure. Those are the best kind of villains where they actually have like, you know, he's trying to do his job and protect the government, but he's also doing it in a really fucked up way. So that's true. I'll take that. Um, the other things that really stood out on that was you know how they have the details on the flashbacks, like when uh, 
you see young Scarlet Witch and you see the bomb go off and you see the Stark industry stuff in there. I like how they're showing the continuity of all that. Um, but what they failed to do for that for me by showing all that stuff in Stark and making it related back in there is you fail so far. And, not, and it's not to say that's not going to happen in the next episode or in the future, but it just fails to be compelling of why, why the Scarlet Witch is upset or, like, is on the side of Tony Stark after they set all this up to show her that, like, Stark's the reason for her problems and grief in life. When really we show that, you know, she used TV as an escapism to escape reality when the, after that bomb went off and there's destruction around her because the TV was still working. And that shows why she was so into shows. And they had, you know, all those flashbacks to, like, her right. using her TV <laughs> It's as like therapy. if they fucking took Cable Guy and compressed it into five minutes and elevated it to a little girl. Exactly. You know I mean? It's the, like that, and then there's that fucking Vandal song. I was right? about to say that, too. Like, <laughs> yes. And if you're not a Vandals fan, man, Hitler Bad Vandals Good is an amazing album, but they have a whole song on there just about being raised by the television set. Fonzie taught him what it means to be cool from Three's Company. He they, learned that just acting gay would lower the amount of actual rent that he would pay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> there's some fucking classic lines in that, but it's definitely got those vibes, and it's not unprecedented to say that you know people are babysitters or latchkey kids are babysat by the TV. There's a whole generational thing about that. Mm, I get it. I relate. I uh, felt old. Like were all those D- all those shows on DVD when she was a kid. It's like, well, that's the thing is people were talking about I how must be a lot older than her. <laughs> well, there's inconsistencies all... in actual time here because someone pointed out that I believe it's Malcolm in the Middle. She has a DVD of, or his dad, her dad does. In 1999, before the show ever oh, aired. Yeah. yeah, I didn't notice that one. Well, he's a time traveler. In the other pieces, <laughs> yeah. it's not like they watched all these American shows on DVD. Some of this is probably syndication as well, right? You know, and pirating American um, pop culture videos and movies and stuff was oh, like yeah. that. I know when my friend uh, Chris traveled to Russia in high school, he bought a you know, pirated version of a Blink-182 album just from somebody on the street selling it, like, looking at it. Look, it looked legit, but it wasn't an actual release. Yeah. So, I mean, it, it happens over there, right? I mean, it happens anywhere. You can really pirate media, but... Um, Thanks, Dad. Yeah, nope. Yeah, it's a public service announcement. <laughs> <laughs> Justin's anti-pirating messages. Uh, it's not an anti-pirating message. I'm just talking about it out there because people like to hush it and put it under the rug. Like, we kind of try to hide Nick and... Well, he's just a lump under the rug. Well, that struck a nerve. <laughs> oh, yeah, I love using quotes from Wild Wild West. Nick, I gotta tell you, it's a lot less fun making fun of you when you're not physically in the room as us. Yeah, it's actually a Aww. lot less fun in general, so next time if you could get your fat ass on the couch, that'd be great. Yeah. I'll be there. <laughs> we need to, uh, yeah, we need to do that. So I don't know if I have much else to say about this episode. Like I said, it was kind of a disappointment, but it had a couple moments that I still really liked, and I'm still hype for the next episode. So, Yeah, and going back to, to the villain piece, it's like you see that they've been channeling her energy to create this white version of the Vision, and I, I'm not familiar with the comics lore on that. I'm sure there's some pretty yeah, interesting I stuff Yeah, I looked it up to see. Yeah, I read I looked it up to see if it was in the comics, yeah. But uh, I think what Paul Bettany was joking when he said that there's someone he's gonna work with that he's always wanted to work with. I think he was just referring to himself. That'd be hilarious. Because there's gonna be two people. visions. <laughs> yeah, I think that's what it's gonna be. Because uh, if you listen to the audio, he does kind of sound like he's kind of plain. Yeah. Yeah. And that would make so sense think, though to be a opposite himself. I mean. Yeah, so I'm not sure we're really gonna get it like a big surprise. Either that, or it's like here. Gilbert Gottfried, which I'm down with. That would be can, like, <laughs> introduce just fucked up, like Polly Shore. And Gilbert Gottfried and Andy Dick should be in the MCU. You know what I'm saying? Oh, my God. Charlie Sheen. No, they'd be better in the DCU because that would make those movies astronomically <laughs> better immediately. <laughs> uh, we said it. Yeah. So that's uh, Water Cooler Cult this week. Uh, if you have any thoughts on this episode of WandaVision, let us know. I mean, it's really just kind of filling in some of the story stuff till we get to the next one. What's next, Doctor? I will tell you what's next. It is, um... Like that little bean. Like that what bean. do you mean you haven't seen this film supreme made up of a dream team? This movie's pretty great. You're fucking late. Let's accelerate and get it on your plate. And you don't want us exposing ourselves. And you don't want us, us, 
exposing ourselves, exposing ourselves. This week on Film Exposure, 9 to 5. This is a goddamn hell of a great flick right here, I'll tell you. Can't believe I'd never seen it. Can't believe more people don't talk about this movie. This movie yeah, I don't fucking, think I've seen it either. This movie laid the groundwork to so many amazing things that came after it, and you can see its influence and broad strokes everywhere, mm-hmm. and this does not get the credit it deserves. For sure. I, uh... Now, this is my idea to cover this movie. You guys hadn't seen it, but I only saw it for the first time like three years ago or something. And it was on kind of a whim after I had seen, um, I think it's Horrible Bosses 2 when they name, they name drop 9 to 5. Because it's also a kidnapping movie. And he was they were like, uh, kidnappers never I get away with what they long. do. And he's like, name one fo- movie where the kidnappers get away with what they did. And one of them's like, 9 to 5. And they're like, yeah, 9 to 5. That's it's it's true. It's and I was like, huh, I've never actually watched that, and I know that Dolly Parton's in it, but now that I know it's a kidnapping movie, I should watch that. And then I watched it, and I was like, holy shit, this fucking rules. And if you're familiar with the Beverly Hillbillies movie, there are um, the three same guy that play, the same guy that plays the boss is Mr. Drysdale, and then Lily Tomlin plays his assistant, and Dolly Parton's at, in there at the bank. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, she has, like, a cameo, is not she? Yeah, so there's yep. three people from that. In but this. you're talking about okay. Dabney Coleman, who's also in Hot for Trot. Yeah, Dabney Coleman. And uh, War Games. War Games is a, another uh, top title for him amongst Dragnet, a, too. Let's not a, forget he's, he's the a pornographer guy, in Dragnet. We should cover that, because I haven't watched that since I was a kid. Dragnet? Yeah. I, I watched it a lot as a kid. But. I watched that movie, like, at least annually, because it's great. <laughs> you watch it annually? I guess Best way to watch way. watch a movie. I mean, I guess if you made it project, yeah. There's some ways. There's a way to make that happen. Uh, I think. Why are you you're, are you fucking burping for? You're not even drinking anything. <laughs> not at this moment. I, you know, I mean, I have a beverage right here, off screen. I gotta say, I think our podcast is the only podcast where I hear people openly belch frequently, <laughs> and by people I mean Alec. Yeah, well, I like to hear it in the microphone, so. <laughs> yeah, I, I know you're just amusing yourself, but everyone else is like, what kind of fucking heathens right. are these people? And I really still don't have an answer for you on that one. So, All right. One episode we opened up with fruit looping yes. discussion. So I don't think me burping is too much of a problem. I mean, you can discuss anything you want. and You know what? Like- I'm going to get a lav mic from my ass, too. So every time I fart, I can do it. And then I can also do it from space. So it'll be like... <laughs> I mean, you can, but... Is it a good idea? Yeah, I'm an audio engineer. I have the technology. We can make it happen. I mean... Laugh mics for all the podcasters' asses. Once you have the money for that, you just let me know, buddy. This is a cheap one. Laugh mics are like 10 bucks if you get them on uh, Amazon. Okay. You won't want to be having that one clipped to you anywhere. If Alex going to clip it on his G-string by his B-hole. I'll just shove it between the cheeks. I got fat enough cheeks that it'll stay right there, baby. And we're also watching this movie because (laughs) of it's Women's Month, and this next Monday is Women's Day. Yes, so it's a little celebration to strong and empowering women, and this movie fucking knocks it out of the park with that. Mm -hmm. And this is this is what you ladies need to do to men: is kidnap them and tie them up and threaten them with guns. Nick's over here trying to sexually <laughs> fantasize out of this. He's like, I want to get kid- I want to get kidnapped. Yeah, we having fun or what? I mean, I, I wouldn't mind being... I think I was even saying that while we watched this. I wouldn't mind being kidnapped and held in this device as long as they were fucking me and feeding me. <laughs> giving yeah. me some weed. That's the problem, though. <laughs> it, that's not going to happen, yeah. Yeah, they might feed you, and I think they were feeding him to keep him alive, obviously, but the rest of it's... Uh... I don't know. I think I could... Back I then, I think I could, a... maybe not Dolly Parton, maybe not Jane Fonda, but I could have tapped Lily Tomlin back then. You know what yeah. I mean? I mean, I could have, I'm not, <laughs> uh, move along. Did he have enough? Did he have enough <laughs> Let's talk about Women's Month bathroom? by talking about how your sexual prowess would allow you to mate with one of them. Okay, no, great I'm idea. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's already laughable at best to be like, we're going to celebrate Women's Month and talk about Alien and 9 to 5. When we didn't even do anything for Black History Month. No, like, really, that's pretty fucked. We talked about it, though. Everything we dropped the ball on that one. And yeah. So. 
Yeah, so that makes that already kind of makes idea. this laughable, but <laughs> well, this is just for Women's Day. We're not celebrating the entire month, but right. <laughs> I mean, that's a good call out. So shame on us for not doing anything for Black History Month. We really fucking dropped the ball with that. Mm-hmm. I apologize. We, right damn! Now. We didn't want to accidentally come off racist, though. <sighs> Only you would do that. <laughs> <laughs> if there's one person on this podcast that no, can come across as accidentally racist, it's Nick. No. Yes. Because Alec was like coming up with movie ideas like eh. No, no, don't try to don't try to blame this on Alec. This no, is not all an Alec I discussed issue. was how if you pick Boys in the Hood, all right, you know, a movie like that, that comes across as offensive because it's not just like we're not gonna get into why and everything, but you know, like it was right. a different reason why I brought those up. I wasn't just like Oh, we're gonna cover black people, <laughs> like. No, and you need, we need we need to have some guests on to get some more enlightened perspective on it than just our take. So, I mean, there's there's a little bit more planning involved to do justice to that whole topic. Oh, for sure. So this anyway, got pretty awkward dark. Silence. Yeah, I was gonna say that got fucking awkward pretty <laughs> quick. It's like walking in on Nick bobbing for apples out of the toilet. It's fucking scary, but you can't stop looking. Oh, man. And it was even worse when I told him that those weren't apples. <laughs> His uh, breath was bad for about a month. So, <clears throat> Dolly Parton has... Um... <laughs> <laughs> I like how you're trying to transition away, and you're just like, no. So, Dolly Parton. <laughs> I, I can't do anything else. Dolly this Parton is, has what? We, we're like 20 minutes into this podcast. And we haven't and we said have anything We crashed and fucking burned over and over. Um, <laughs> but Dolly Parton, this I was actually going to say a real thing. <laughs> and you forgot? No, I have it written well, down. Oh, okay. I was going to say, say that Dolly... she bought all of her um, wardrobe from this movie, and it's on display at Dollywood. Which, mm-hmm. by the way, we need to go to Dollywood. You ever heard of that? It's Dolly Parton's theme park? Yeah. Yeah. Is I want to go Kentucky? there. Kentucky? I think it's in Kentucky, yes. Or because every time I drive, I used to drive through Kentucky. It was she was always performing like every weekend. Yeah, so I think cool. Let's go her. see Dolly Parton at Dollywood. Yeah, I mean, let's go. It's a once in a lifetime experience, unless you live there. I would do it or work there. It's not too far, I guess. All right, so back into this movie. Uh, we're we're talking about that movie. Yeah, we're talking about the wardrobe. And um, not, well, we're not going to now. But what were you going to say? This movie's just so ahead of its time for, like, you know, like, the Me Too movement and everything else going on. Like, I'm surprised, like, they didn't really champion things around this movie. Just because the way it shows, like, the sexism that women were experiencing, you know, in the late 70s. Obviously, this came out in 1980, so you're assuming they probably wrote it in 77, 78, shot it, released it by 80, you know, so... And it's all based off, like, shit that's believable. Like, you watch that and you're like, yeah, that, that sounds about right. Yeah, the women. Sounds about right. It's they're, so they're, amazing as far as the way it just shows like the reality of that while still being funny and not taking itself too serious. Yeah. Um, I think Dolly Parton's perf- character, everyone, all the women in the office seemed to hate her because they thought she was having an affair with him. Really yeah, she, really she wasn't. wasn't. Yeah, and, and he's out there spreading that rumor that he was sleeping with her, and you're like, what? And then she got so fucking Typical pissed shit. about that. Yeah, like the same kind of bullshit that people still experience, unfortunately. But it's just well done the way, like, I don't know. Dolly Parton, say what you will about her. She's very in tune with cultural shit and does an excellent job in this movie. I, like, she's the standout there besides Dabney Coleman does a great job. Dolly even. Parton is a god, and now I want a Frog Brothers podcast shirt that has her on it. So <laughs> let's make that happen. Uh, I mean... She's now part of the collective... She's part of the hive mind. Yes, she's part of the Frog Brothers legends. That's what we'll call them. Along with, you know, Alf and the Frog Brothers. My penis. Your ass. Nick's mouth. And we're off track again. (laughs) That's me clapping, not pretending to masturbate. Yeah, you you gotta watch the video version for that, because when he pretends to masturbate, he does authentic sounds as well. Mm -hmm. He cracked cracked there for sure. Yeah. Um, So this was originally planned to have a VHS release the same day as theater. Sound like anything you know of? Hmm. 
That's speaking wild. of also being very current. But the theaters wouldn't allow it. Sounds about right, yeah. Your father wanted you to have this VHS, but your uncle wouldn't allow it. Basically. Was, was it... that when VHSs were like $40 a pop? Or... Yeah. Probably. Still but still, theaters, theaters were like, nope. Yeah. Right. So they ended up releasing it, pushing it back three months, I think. So this was probably one of the fewest movies, like after three months you could get it on VHS. That's pretty crazy still. Yeah, because I remember in the '80s, it was like seemed to be on like a average, year and a half, a year, a year wait basically. Sometimes it'd be less than a year if they're trying to hit the holiday season. Well, oh, especially if it's like a big release, then they'd start printing them well ahead of time and know what they're doing and shit. But I remember when it was a big deal, like when you could get a summer blockbuster, you know, from like June or July on VHS in time for Christmas, so yeah. you could ask for it for Christmas, and like you just hit that six month mark or close to it, and you're like, oh, we can get it. So. Uh, that was pretty magical, and now it's usually, what, two to three months turnaround time, if it's not a simultaneous release anymore? Yeah. I mean, pre-COVID, it probably was a couple months usually. It's so easy to pirate now that they want to get their official release out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah that's probably a very true point, right? Mm-hmm. VHS takes time to copy, right? You can't just spread it around the Internet like Nick spreads pictures of his butthole. <laughs> you know, those things, those things don't go viral, but they could give you a viral load. I bleached it. Again? Man, you gotta watch out for that. It's like whitening your teeth. You can only do that so often before it becomes unhealthy. Yeah, I don't know. Anyway, so what did you, what was your takeaway from this, Nick? What did you like in this? Uh, my favorite part was the uh, nurse finding the dead body in the bathroom. Over in the wheelchair. Oh yeah, yeah, that was a good scene. You Does just that feel look on her <laughs> look on her face like a fucking gin. Like, are you serious? I like another dead body in the back. <laughs> I I think my one of the stick out moments. There's a couple for me. Is one of them is when they're smoking weed and they're all just laughing, and then they start doing the flashback sequences. Are they fantasizing about? Yeah, like killing the sequences. The boss. Yeah, that's yeah. what I meant. Like the fantasies. Um, then they're when they when they have the body in the trunk and they open it up. And she tries to verify that it's him or whatever. She's just, like, getting him ready. And then she notices that it's not him. And she's like, who is that? And then the, they each come up, and as soon as they see the face, also say, who is that? And it's like, what'd you do with the body? And just, yeah. Who's this? That, shit that was great. Laugh. I loved that they had um, Mr. Hart on that fucking garage door opener so they could raise him up and lower him down. I'm like, who the fuck <laughs> puts a garage door opener in their fucking bedroom? But it's genius. Like, I just loved, like, how absurd that was. Like, it's so stupid and over the top, but it just works. And, like, anytime he's, like, trying to get away or get, get loose, you know, after he stole that nail file or found that nail file in the bathroom drawer, and they just, like, raise him up so he can't get free again. I yeah. uh, was at the bathroom drawer. I was wondering if he actually could reach the bathroom or not. Yeah, no, he had access, He had enough slack to get into the bathroom and everything uh, else, and so he like pulled the drawer out and found that n- uh, nail file. I thought that was the, the dresser. I like it when Dolly Parton's fucking tying him up in his own office, and he's he's just laughing because he's, he's thinking he can get out of this, and then he doesn't realize she's serious and shit until it's fucking too late, and he's like, wait a second. Wait a oh, second. yeah, when she really hog ties his ass? Yeah, yeah. that was awesome. And th- the best part I- of that is they, they took some of the stuff that happened in the fantasy and kind of like put it in how it played out in real life. Yeah. And, yeah. you know, and it just works. It's so funny. It's great. And then, you know, just the utter mass confusion of what the hell when they think they've rat poisoned him and everything else. And, yeah. you know, all that stuff just going down. Like, it's... Oh, think about how many movies those. that influenced and has, like, kind of stolen that concept and ran with it. Like, Alec, you specifically mentioned Horrible Bosses. Those two movies really kind of run with that vibe, for sure. Mm-hmm. So and they, they I would almost say like in his name that made the workplace better. And... I mean, I would say like Mike Judge had an influence. It was influenced by this with like office space and extract to some degree, just like the way some of the office was set up, the way some of the characters are around in there. Yeah. Um, there's a lot of influence. Oh, yeah. I really like that out. woman in the office who's just like really deadpan. Yeah. What's that? I can't remember I don't, know, I don't know if she had it up. She's the one that turns out to line, be the alcoholic, but... and they're like, oh, yeah, and then... Yeah. Um, and I like how they turn it into such a positive story. Like, I don't know if they would do that same thing now or if it would come across super cheesy. No, these days... Originally, this movie was written how it would be these days, which was with them actually trying to kill him. 
Oh, okay. Like instead of the fantasy sequences, they were actually plots to kill him. Oh, okay. So, but I mean, at the end, like when they showed that they got the daycare, the productivity's up twenty percent. Like everything that they show off and like how it works yeah. and it's better for employee experience. You're like, damn, like that's. 1980 like the, people are still trying to figure this out in yeah. big corporations today like just take care of your the, people the president he's like he liked everything but the equal pay part he's like that part's gotta go <laughs> oh yeah well uh, that's still a problem today though so i mean yeah. there's, there's still a lot of things there that are very timely oh that was funny ridiculous pretty much any final thoughts on this one um all right i immediately regret our earlier conversation about um, sleeping with Lily Tomlin. I'll just say that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Probably shouldn't have said that, but hey, you learn. Uh, yeah, you you smoke weed and you make the, mistakes. <laughs> she would have been the easiest one to score with. Is what she reminds me of that tattoo. Well, no, right? I was just saying, I think she and her, me would have vibed the most. Oh. Uh, okay. You know what I mean? Like, that's what I was okay. saying. Like, realistically, I would have been able to get with her because we would have vibed. And Jane Fonda obviously would have been like, she was at the top well, of her shit at the time, and so was Dolly Parton. Dolly Parton is just in a whole other god well, level. Like so, yeah. yeah, I see what you're saying. Because the way she acts, I would get along with her the most. Because she's just fun, kind of like pissed off, and she wants to smoke weed. I'm like, I relate to this woman. The thing in this movie that's the most upsetting, and it's really a minor gripe, is that the theme song is so fucking awesome. And it's only at the beginning of the movie. Yeah. And I love it because it shows up in Deadpool 2 when they're doing the Didn't... montage sequence, and it's so fucking perfect for that. And I, that's such a great song still, mm. just on its own. Like, I love Dolly Parton's I music. Misremembering, I might be misremembering, but I thought there was an orchestral version of it at one point. Uh, there might be. Yeah, th I mean, there probably was. I mean, you know, that was very common for the time, but I mean, that's a really a fucking... That's got like a little bit of funk to it for that tune, right? And it really just works well, so... Yeah, that's just a good fucking. That's a that's a good solid song. recording. Holds up too. So. Mm -hmm. I still listen to it. Yeah, I got it in some playlists. So. All right. Well, that's nine to five. If you haven't seen it, I would highly recommend watching it. It's uh, where do we see that streaming free? That's on Hulu right now, I believe. So yeah, I think so. Idea. Um. Hey, speaking yeah. of Hulu, you want to jump over? Jump over to what? Episode by episode. I guess so. We usually do that at the end, but we can throw it in the middle. I don't have any notes on that, though, so it's all going to be from right here, baby. All right. Well, we'll mix it up today a little bit. Stir all right. it up. If you don't like extreme Ghostbusters, just wait about a little bit of time. I don't know how many minutes we'll talk about this. We now return to the real Ghostbusters. Diane, 11.30 a.m., February 24th. Entering the town of Twin Peaks. Pretty, pretty, pretty good. Bill Murray's the funniest man in like Episode by episode. Sometimes I wonder if it is. So, this will be the last episode of Extreme Ghostbusters. For we, now. We cover again for a while. So, like we went on a hiatus before, we're going to go on another one because, as of today, it is no longer available on Hulu. Fucking I thought God about uh, purchasing a supposedly good copy of the entire series off of eBay. Well, you can find like it was released bucks somewhere else. Yeah, I think it was released in Australia or something, maybe. Yeah, somewhere weird, and it's like, what the fuck? <clears throat> I mean, they have to be thinking but about... I had this I had this queued up last night. I had my Hulu open. I had it selected to that episode, and I guess at some point they cut it off, so when I went to push play, it was just gone, so I didn't get to watch it. Shut it, ain't son of a bitch! Well, sounds about right. So Nick didn't watch the last two episodes. Nope. And now he wants to buy it. A copy on eBay. Tsk, yeah. tsk, 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 tsk. Hopefully they'll actually get an official release going for us. I think there's enough popularity with it right now and trying to bring the brand back that it... That's what I'm hoping. We're in a 90s nostalgic period, too, so anyone who's, like, my age who connects this with this show a little and... bit more, like, in terms of... I don't remember watching any... the original run of Real Ghostbusters. I only remember the VHS tapes and when ABC Family brought it back. You know what I mean? That's my age bracket. So Extreme Ghostbusters was my shit. Yeah, I remember showing you Real Ghostbusters on Tuna Casserole because we didn't, only, you know, we had one VHS tape with the three episodes. On Which, it. by the way, I'm surprised that didn't melt just from being watched so much. Like, <laughs> yeah, it's a. Uh... 
It got it got its we got its money's worth, I'll tell you that. Oh yeah. What's, so episode what's number twenty five. You don't remember tuna casserole? Mm. You not have cable growing up? I don't even know what you're talking about. Tuna casserole <laughs> was on one of the cartoon channels that showed like that's when they it brought back the real familiar. I think it was on it was on the family channel and then it became like ABC Family Channel or something else. Oh, that's, that's yeah, it was there. ABC Family that it aired on because I remember seeing the logo on all of our yeah. tapes and on the ones we did with Tony, those DVDs, it's all ABC Family logos. Yeah, so Tuna so Casserole is a segment where they just like, you know, replayed a bunch of older shows, you know, since they didn't have a lot of original this was content on that channel. a cable channel 57 back in the day in Olathe, Kansas. Jones Inner Cable. Uh, so... This episode, number 25, is called In Your Dreams. It's a pretty good one. Um, there's some fun mm. stuff going on in it. So, yeah, you know, you got, a, good. you got a little soft <laughs> opening there. This male guy's in a warehouse, and he starts having, like, this... You're not sure if it's... You know, you come to find out that it's not really happening. It's a dream he's having. But he's, like, freaking out about processing all this mail, and I'm assuming he's the male person in the building. And then you see this uh, fucking asshole that looks like Thanos... Oh, yeah, that's what I said. Yeah, it's like, this, this is Thanos-looking this motherfucker. This Thanos jaw-having motherfucker coming through telling us all about this, uh, you know, basically belittling this employee and uh, talking shit, and then the guy wakes up, and there's this squid-looking thing above him sucking his fuck, you know, attached to him, like, sucking stuff out of him. You suck that guy's dick? Yeah, basically, <laughs> except it says head, so um, uh, however that works. Yeah, <laughs> riddle me that, Batman. Um. Yeah, those things are, they could have been designed cooler. They look like They're easy to shitty. animate, and yeah. so sometimes like you see like a simplistic design, and you're like, okay, I see why they did that route, but yeah, if you really want They could have made it, it wouldn't have required too much effort to make it so much more no. interesting, but whatever, those were a little lame, but yeah, some parts of the episode are cool, but you can also see where they're trying to do a Sandman-type episode without being the Sandman, but with giving the same vibes. Yeah, Sandman's um, still a better episode overall. For sure. And a better villain. Just bring Sandman back. Why not? Yeah, who cares? That's what they should have done. Yep, so then you get the old classic bug rock thing. Yeah. It's a something strange. And a dirty diaper. Who are you going to call? Ghostbusters. Exactly. So that pretty much sums up the uh, intro. Mm -hmm. Then we get right into it. They're at the hospital investigating this kind of stuff going on. And they're trying to figure out what it is because they're not getting any PKE meter readings, which is an interesting concept in itself. They have that repeated throughout these shows a lot where they're like, we're not getting any PKE readings. Well, it's always something they don't understand or it's something new. And I get, right, you know, because if you just animated like, hey, them catching a ghost, well, yeah, you could make it more interesting, I guess, but... Um, It'd be interesting. I need to go back and watch some more real Ghostbusters because I want to see if they have as many patterns in the show as this one does. Um, this one even has the same thing uh, where most episodes uh, episodes of Extreme Ghostbusters, a lot of them, what they do is they have this thing, something happens, a bunch of people are affected by it, more and more people, and then at the end they're all back to normal. Yeah, starting with the pilot. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, you get a lot of that on there. So... Just be interesting to see if Real Ghostbusters has some of that as well, but yeah, I don't know. Yeah, so the Ghostbusters, like I said, they're at the hospital there, and it says, uh, "I hope you took a nap because you have the graveyard shift." Eddie says that to Kylie when they're talking about staying up late to watch this, and I wrote that line down. It was kind of the funny ones, you know. Eddie gets the funny one-liners usually. Garrett can be kind of a smart ass, but in this episode, he's kind of played fairly straight. So yeah. He has his basketball dream where he's playing basketball, and then Thanos comes and um, basically ruins his dream and makes him have a nightmare and belittles him and talks shit to him. Fun stuff. Yeah. So. Um, Eduardo's dream is the best. Oh, Eduardo's dream is glorious. Because I also have that dream, at least part of it. Yeah, and it's interesting because how they sexualize Kylie on this show, and, like, I think that's really the only time they really show that. Like, you know, they almost basically have her with, like, a wide-open dress, like, showing off cleavage, but they didn't really go that full route with it. But, you know, Eduardo's, like, dreaming about Kylie and getting with her, and then she's like, you know, you're a loser. And then he starts going bald, and he wakes up bald, too, after that. Mm -hmm. And obviously she's dating Thanos in her dream. 
Which is, um, yeah, that's a funny sequence because he has like 50s, like pompadour, badass hair. But yeah, it's just interesting that, like you were saying, the sexual tension between Eduardo and Kylie is something like the people of this show tried to do because they wanted to, they wanted this to be a little more adult than real Ghostbusters was. And they were just limited with what they could do because they were still a children's cartoon, basically, so... And it's funny because Eduardo later on tells her that he dreamed about her to her face, right? Which is kind of funny because she's like, wait, you dreamed about me? And, like, kind of was creeped out by it. So it was a fitting reaction. So it was a funny segment there. The other piece I thought was interesting was the homeless shelter that, like, essentially gets destroyed and they're able to rescue everyone out of. But, you know, they see everyone's in there having these nightmares as well. So... um, there's like a subtle moment in there where they didn't really develop it, but you could tell they wanted to, but they just had the subtle lines of like, since it's the radio broadcaster that's doing this, like once right. the radio gets, once the radio in this homeless shelter gets destroyed, like everyone kind of snaps out of it. So here's quick. an interesting thing, just in general, like you were saying, that that already reminds me of Sandman just because there's that radio scene. Yep. But also just, are you familiar with a lot of, any other examples of like um, the radio being used in a paranormal or creepy way like this. Yeah, exactly. I like, mean, um, obviously the movie like White Noise and stuff like that, yeah. you know, but there's also in Twin Peaks Season 3, The Return, there's the, what are they called? The uh, Woodsmen. And they're like, they look like woodsy uh, hillbillies, but they're all covered in black ash. Okay. And they're spectral type of interdimensional beings that come across and do fucked up shit and there's this one guy who shows up in the 50s goes to a radio station while this shit's happening and like fucking kills the shit out of the people that work there on the air and then starts he says um like a poem and he just repeats it over and over over the radio broadcast and it starts doing shit that you don't necessarily understand what it's doing because it's david lynch but yeah he says something like this is the water and this is the well Drink full and descend. The horse is the white of the eyes and dark within. And that's the whole poem. He just repeats it over and over. But it's pretty fucking creepy. I mean, in concept, it's pretty fun. And, you know, obviously, this guy's kind of a Rush Limbaugh type because he's kind of an asshole, right? No one really likes him. And you kind of get shock those jock. vibes. Yeah, shock jock, kind of a jerk, just trying to be controversial on the radio. And so even when they go down there to try to confront him, like, he's talking serious shit on him. Yeah. Um, and makes fun of the Ghostbusters, which is entertaining, right? Because, you know, you kind of get those vibes that by Ghostbusters 2, that was probably a real hot topic on the actual radio and, you know, in that universe. Yeah. So you could see where that would make sense. Um, But then again, it's like one of those that, like, wraps up so fast. Like, they're just like, okay, we got to the 19-minute marker, and now we've got to finish this thing out, like, immediately. Yeah. And For so sure. they battle this ghost on the roof. They get him to manifest into their plane, even though they're like, why would he manifest into our plane if he knows we could catch him then? And then they catch him immediately, and then they make fun of him for being an idiot ghost. <laughs> Which is kind of like, eh, okay. I mean, it works. It's a fun episode. There's some neat concepts in it. Um, the dream sequences that everyone's having is kind of unique. I like that. Yeah. Uh, the grimace-looking Thanos villain is, is fun. Um, his character design was much better than the, uh, I don't know if you want to call them mind eaters or whatever else you want to call them, but yeah, they're, uh, I hate those designs, but usually I like the designs of this show. So it's a rare occasion for me. Oh, Janine and Egon's dreams are very interesting in that episode too. Oh yeah. Because, because Egon's walking around with a huge cock. At least yeah, that's what I think. Yeah, he's covering up with the newspaper, and he's just walking around naked, and like they, you know, they what? do everything they can to show that that he's he starts just... covering up his ass, but leaving his <laughs> cock hanging out. Like your butt crack, you can't show people, but you're going to show him your cock because I think in his dream he had a huge cock, so he was really confident and like, fuck it, I'll show off my dick now. I mean, maybe, but I think that was just how they're trying to animate the angles that they're having the conversation oh, for sure. through storyboarding. But, but if yeah. you think about it, still, Elon's oh. walking around covering up his butt crack with a Trust newspaper, me. having his big old clock. And then Hanging Janine out. is alone in the world looking for Egon. Do you like, think his pubes are as cool as his actual hair was? Oh. Uh, it's I probably hope. a ponytail now, but like back <laughs> in the real Ghostbusters, do you think his pubes like would have been like a swirly badass <laughs> thing? I don't know. <laughs> uh, now you've taken or, it Almost from... like a, the pubes looking like a cornucopia. <laughs> you know what I mean? Happy Thanksgiving, everyone. <laughs> uh, Happy Thanksgiving, man. everyone. Look at my penis. Oh, that's funny. It is mud. <laughs> on the newspaper exactly 
So that's uh, episode 25. So once we get to episode 26 on YouTube, we'll be back to cover more extreme Ghostbusters. Until then, um, we're going to switch over to... Top five. 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 This is top five. This is top five. So... Nick, you want to tell us what the top five is this week? Top five films directed by a woman. <gasps> a woman, you say? I Directing a that. film. So be it. I would just like to point out some historical facts for you guys before we even start this list. Thank you. Go ahead. There's a woman, perhaps you've heard of her, perhaps you haven't, named Alice Guy Blatch. Um, she's French, so I don't know. That's I'm butchering the shit out of that last name, by the so way. You sound she's like French, me talking, you know but that. thanks. Exactly. Um, she is one of the first directors ever. In fact, she directed the first narrative film. Oh. Hell yeah. So therefore, the first real director of modern cinema and movies is a woman. Was a woman. So let's just point that out right off the fucking get-go. She has a, there's a documentary, I can't remember what it's called, Came out about her recently, or last year, I think. Um, but 1896 was the year of her first narrative movie. Um, I have the name of that written down also, but again, it's French. I'm going to butcher the shit out of it, but I'm going to do it anyway because it's funny to me. Uh, it says, La Fille à Choux. Bless you. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, that's pretty interesting. You should um, look her up. Again, Alice Guy Blash. I don't know, block. It's <laughs> guy dash B L A C H E with a dash over the E. I don't know what those are called. Umlauts or something. The umlauts are the German things, I think, actually. So yeah, I don't fucking know what I'm talking about when it comes to foreign languages, but that's what you should you should look that up and learn about it. Learn those foreign languages, kids. Learn learn about that lady, because she's fascinating. So yeah, she with that in mind. Stuff. Nick, what's your number five? My number five is big. Yes. It's bulky, but I consider it carry-on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, what's the director of that film? Was it... Oh, you oh my God. Down. You didn't write down the director? Mm-mm. What kind of monster are you, you fucking <laughs> sicko? <laughs> I forgot. The director of Big is Penny Marshall. Directed that That's movie. That's what I was going to say. I it was released in the year 1998. Penny Marshall also directed A League of Their Own. Yeah, that's one. Uh, Another Tom Hanks film. That would have been on my top ten if we had done a ten. Just fun Big facts. would have been on my top ten if we did a top ten, maybe. But it's not. It's not. Well, my number five... Is Clueless, directed by Amy Heckerling in 1995. For one of those movies, it's kind of like almost considered a chick flick. It's really not. It's a really broad comedy that just happens to be centered around female characters. Both of you just mentioned my honorable mentions list. Oh, yeah? No, that's mm-hmm. great. And it's obviously got Paul Rudd, hometown hero in there, too, in one of his earlier roles. And Shout out, know. Paul Rudd. Yep, and that's just a funny movie. I mean, it's it's really it holds up still. It's it's still pretty hilarious, right? A yeah. lot of movies have tried to capture the magic of that movie, but have never actually been able to, to succeed. That movie's still a cult classic, and, and it gets respect amongst cult film lovers. So, so at least it has uh, that going for what's it. What's your uh, number five there, Alan? My number five is the 1982 classic Fast Times at Ridgemont High, directed by Amy Heckerling. Ooh. Um, that movie rules. Um, it's seriously underrated. It also, I mean, can we just talk about Judge Reinhold, Phoebe Cates, um, Jennifer Jason Lee, very young in that movie. And also she's like fully naked, even though she plays a 16 year old, but she's like 19. But they show like what is supposed to be a 16 year old naked. It has like a lot of weird shit in it, but it's also like very, it's like one of the most realistic, probably the earliest realistic portrayal of teenagers in high school because they are doing shit like driving around smoking and fucking and trying to fuck each other and shit yeah and there's definitely moments in that movie that are 
clearly scripted in that aspect, but like you said, it really captures like the day-to-day -day bullshit, but they have to tell the story, so they sensationalize the parts that need sensationalize. The rest yeah, of honestly, it seems authentic. My favorite characters in that are Phoebe Cates and Jennifer Jason Lee's characters. Um, Judge Reinhold's really cool too, and his segments are fucking hilarious. But like the main character, uh, Mike Ratner or whatever, he's way less interesting than those two. So, like, it's really just good portrayal of teenagers in general. But also, the teenage women in that movie are just like super realistic, and it like doesn't try to like wash it over and make them. I don't know. It just celebrates like women can be sexual too without having to look like you, you know be judged for it and shit like that. Yeah, it's it captures that pretty well, and obviously the director obviously had some credence to why that worked and and how those characters were actually portrayed, and you know the actors doing their roles in those. So yeah, nice one there, Nick. Number four. My number four is Alex. Number five. All right, very nice. Mm. Any very any nice. comments? Good to choice. Add. Mm. I don't think so. It did, I did ramble on about that one for a minute. Oh, that's good. That's I, I, don't, right. I think it was a long time before I realized a woman directed it. One of the, I, I, that's one of like the DVDs I bought in the when I was like 16 or 17. I was buying a bunch of like 80s movies. I bought like a set that came with that had just come out with Breakfast Club, 16 Candles, and Weird Science. And then I oh, bought yeah. Fast Times came with Dazed and Confused. Yeah, they had some of those two and four packs that were really yeah. popular when that wasn't that when Target had a lot of those like that slip, Happy Gilmore with Billy Madison like slip covers like special yeah. slip covers of all those that were kind of like cheesy looking but yeah they're multi packs yeah so my number four is a uh, big like I said directed by Penny Marshall 1988 and choosing that between that and a league of their own big I think is just let's be honest the guy loves toys is a toy designer in that movie when he becomes a grown up there's a lot of things in that movie that I really like. Uh, a League of Their Own is great. That's definitely an honorable mention. So she's clearly a very talented director. Yeah, Appreciate I haven't her seen work. that since I was a kid either. Or so else I probably would have considered that for my life. No, I still watch A League of Their Own pretty regularly. Just it's it holds up. It's great. Hmm. It's a good movie. So that's my number four. My number four. I guarantee has to be on at least one of your lists. And if it's not on both of your lists, then you one of you clearly overlooked it at some point, but I had to rate it where I did, as at a, I, I think it'll be higher on your guys' list. But anyway, Wayne's World from 1992, directed by Penelope Spheris. Good choice. Fucking Thanks. classic. Um, you know, it's like you could... Wayne's World and Wayne's World 2... Wayne's World 2 is one of those movies where it's just about as good as the first one. They're, like, pretty much on the same wavelength. There's not really, like a huge drop off in quality or increase yeah, it's a it's, it's pretty consistent and great but i just listed the first movie because you know but i wasn't going to include both on this list yeah that, and that makes sense right those are well done and again when you have a great sequel it's because they don't just try to rehash or give you more of the same they mm -hmm. take those characters and present them in a new manner give them new situations while still allowing them to be faithful to who you know them as yeah it's fucking brilliant yep uh, that is not on my list. Uh, there's, there's a me either. I actually didn't even think. Of it. Uh, See, that's what it was like. I figured you would have to overlook it for it not to be on your list, Nick. It would probably be on a lot of other lists too. So, yeah, no, that's. An and awesome I'm genuinely one. surprised that's not that's not on your list. But big is you like um, big better than Wayne's World. Me no, not you, Justin. I, honestly, I'm just asking. Oh. No, but when I'm talking about. Just when I was compiling this list and looking up that stuff, I you know I I, I kind of put down things that really stood out to me. So yeah, I get like, it. Big really holds up for me. It's still a really fun movie. So I just for me it doesn't compare to Wayne's World. It's in a different universe. I still like Big, but I I think other people like it more than me. So that makes sense. I mean I've cosplayed several times as Garth, so of course I love Wayne's World. Yeah. What's your number three, Nick? Uh, lost. Or Lost in Translation by Sofia Coppola. Classic. That's a good choice. I appreciate that one. Which I just watched uh, recently, just like a week or two ago again. Is that? Yeah, we're going to cover that at some point, because um, I'm uh, obsessed with that movie also. That is uh, also my number three. Um, what, was the name of that? what was the name of that alcohol he does a commercial for? Uh, Centauri. Yeah. yeah. 
So relaxing other, times. Another great movie by Sophia that I debated putting on this list in place of this one. Virgin Suicides? Virgin Suicides, because that yes. is so fucking good. I forget how good that movie is. That movie is just harder to watch. Yeah, it's, well, it's fucking dark. Really yeah. dark. Like, Lost in Translation sure I've seen is that. I've only watched it once. I've seen it two or three times, and it's one of those that, yeah, you've... My ex has our copy of it. <laughs> That's a movie I would say, make sure you're in a happy mental state before you watch it, because it's going to be a downer, and if you're not feeling good when you watch a movie like that, it just takes you to dark places that I don't think you should just intentionally yeah. go. That's why I don't... That's, it's, it's hard to watch, but it is a brilliant movie also. So, But Lost in Translation, for me, has a, a higher replay value. It's much more enjoyable. There's a lot of subtlety in there that I could watch that movie mm. rather frequently and still find new things to enjoy about it. So. Yeah. So my number three could be controversial to some, at least maybe in its number three placement, but it's the 1991 Catherine Bigelow classic Point Break. Um, yeah, that would have been on my top ten. I don't know what it is, man. Once I watched Point Love Break, that movie. dude, yeah, it's fucking so good. I, I, it, it's there's something about it too that has this quality that's like, I feel like I've been watching it my whole life and I haven't been. It fits in with these other movies in a place where I'm like, you... God damn, I just it connects to me somehow. You when know what I mean? So you first watched it. Five years ago, six years ago, I don't know, something like that. Yeah, I didn't even watch that until like until I heard uh, Craig talking about it all the time on Yes Have Some, and then at that point, I was that's like, what How surprises did I me movie? that you didn't. That surprised me you didn't watch it a lot as a kid too, dude. That to movie that, to me, and I'm I'm just gonna go ahead and and cut you off here on number two, Nick, since we're talking about it already. That's my number two, and what, what that movie is so well done, and it's amazing, and it's one of those movies. I first time I watched it. It just seemed like one of those movies I'd seen a million times. Hmm. It instantly fit in a place. There's like an opening just yeah. like saved in That's my mind. That's what I'm saying. There's like a spot for it. It was like, there's a book missing off this shelf. And when I finally watched it, it was like, ah, the book got returned to the library. <laughs> you know, and it was like finally there. And it was like, oh, okay, that was worth the wait. I really enjoyed that movie. I like, I, Speed was kind of the same way for me, seeing it as an adult, although I like it a bunch less. I would rather watch Point Break any day than Speed. But Speed has a sort of, place where i don't have to take this movie super seriously um but it fits in to this weird universe where i didn't watch it till i was really an adult or at least i may have as a kid but i was too young to remember it so it's like i like being able to watch old movies for the first time now and then still love them as much as other ones you know what i mean so. Well, this movie works in so many levels because, like, Gary Busey's great, and it's probably one of his best roles he's ever had, I would argue. Mm -hmm. Is he ever not great, though? You yes. know what I mean? Like, sometimes he's very satir... Yeah. You know, he's, like, very... How do you say satirical? Satirical? Sat yeah, there it is. I can't fucking think of it. I'm the that. stoned one. Uh, I'm just stupid. Don't mind <laughs> me. Um, but, you know, sometimes they come across that way, so... Yeah. Um. So, Nick, what's your number two? Uh, you Were Never Really There by, I think her name's Lynn Ramsey. I'm not familiar with that one. Elaborate. Um, it came out in 2017. I actually just watched it for the first time maybe a couple months ago. It's Joaquin Phoenix, and he plays like a hitman kind of thing. Hmm. He was right. hired by like a governor to retrieve his daughter who's like been... Is this more of an indie release, or was it like a wider yeah. release? Okay. Yeah. And his daughter's been like taken by like sex traffickers or whatever the governor's daughter and she he hires him to get her okay uh, pretty good the more you describe it the less interested i am but <laughs> well i, I mean, still it still could be worth a watch it sounds like taken but with joaquin phoenix and i'm down for that i'll give it a shot it, it's, it's i mean that's what makes it. it sound like shit to me is it sounds like no, another it, movie with another actor like and it taken. also it's kind really, of sounds like the really fugitive well and all those harrison ford early 90s movies i want my family back yeah that kind of uh, it's more understated and low-key than a crazy oh well that's big, good big action movie you know? um it's more of like is it more of a detective study. detective type work in the movie than actual like revengeful violence no but the violence isn't like hardcore okay but speaking it's, of it's hardcore like violence a character study of we're not allowed to talk about that anymore life. <laughs> <laughs> jesus christ Okay, um, I was saying, 
speaking of hardcore violence, my number two is American Psycho, directed by Mary Heron from the year 2000. Um, this is one of my favorite movies and one of my favorite books. Uh, and it is one of the best adaptions of a novel. It's, it's, a, it's pretty close to what you would expect out of a movie of, a, of that book. Like, it doesn't... It, it gets you there. And it's a very artful and confusing movie. Um, also very satirical. So... I need to do an audio book of that. It's fucked, man. Listen to while I work. <laughs> I don't know how that would end for you. All right, Nick, what's your number one? Uh, my number one is Alex number two. That's funny, because that's my number one as well. That's funny. I, I figured it was high on your old. And I say that, so... <laughs> Funny fact, right? And I'm gonna cut you off, Nick, because it's my podcast and you're you're a bitch. <laughs> um, Rude. I know, but if you go back and listen to when we review this, like I was very cautious because I didn't know. Like we didn't review this. We Where? have yet to review this movie. We are going to. Think, we mentioned it in a top five or something. Oh, um, yeah. okay. Or something else. Now you like guys that. have talked about it. I know we talked okay. about it. And we I just mentioned it. For remember sure. specifically talking about like how violent it was and everything else. And um, oh, um, didn't you guys do a top five like uh, books, the movie? Translation maybe that's what it was. Like but that. yeah, if, if you've yeah. listened to that old episode, it was like I was just being very cautious about you know where the podcast was going and stuff. But when you really look at this movie as being satire and you view it through that lens, a hundred percent, and not take everything so literal. It's amazing. And the subtlety that I think having a female point of view as the director really makes it more palatable to rewatch, right? I think it would have been a different movie had someone else directed it, obviously. But, I mean, I think it would have been drastically different than the result we've got. Yeah. Um, and the performance, specifically. Like, the, Christian Bale, like, you know, he's huge now, but when he did that movie, it was like, oh, okay, who's this? Yeah, you know who was originally supposed to play Patrick Bateman? Leonardo DiCaprio, which I'm not saying would have been bad or good, but Christian Bale nails it. He captures it. He's perfect. Yeah, because like Leonardo DiCaprio in that era, you know, this came out in 2000, and you look at that, he's got the chops, right? You look at Basketball Diaries, you look at What's Eating Gilbert Grapes. I mean, Titanic is great, He's got the skills, but in that movie, I, I just, it's hard for me to imagine that because it didn't happen. Yeah. So I, that's after seeing I him really in stuff say. like Django Unchained and Wolf of Wall Street, I'm like, no, he could probably pull that off. But oh uh, yeah, and that's probably why he was in such high contention for the role, right? Yeah. But sometimes you just have to expand. I think he your was mind. too young, too twink, twink like at the time. He was a twink still back then. Now he's uh he's more like an otter these days. So well, yeah, and he was very uh, he was very in his heartthrob years <laughs> there, right? You know, like, yeah. where everyone's just like, oh, you're just like a cute piece of meat, and I think that would have been distracting for what the movie actually oh, was and the right. message within it. So. I think they did a good good choice with their casting. That's my favorite Christian Bale role of all time. I mean, I know he did Batman, but he... Uh, oh, that's how he got Batman, right? So, I'm sure, because that's what's funny. Anytime you the, see him walking around as Batman in the suit, I'm always like, he's about to fuck somebody up. He's about to, like, fucking brutally murder and rape some people. This is and fucked. he's like an emotionless asshole, which works so well for Bruce Wayne. You need to do, like, combine a trailer of that. Oh, yes. Where, like, you see Bruce Wayne going like this, fucking in the <laughs> mirror, and then it goes to, like, Batman and shit. Well, splice those scenes into Batman. I need yeah. to do that for real. Well, also in the movies, like American Batman. And like in the movies, like this is basically a mask. This is, there's no real Patrick Bateman. Exactly. There is no like real. Bat- yeah. Not only Batman. an entity. Yeah. Something Alex illusory. <laughs> and though I can hide my cold a... gaze, and you'll shake my hand and feel flesh gripping yours, and maybe you can even sense our lifestyles are probably comparable. <laughs> I simply am not there. Yeah, I know this movie like I know Ghostbusters. You know what I mean? Yeah, this is a, a that's right from the book too. So. Significant movie. So that's that's what are that's your other thoughts here. on that? You know what what makes that stand out to you, Nick? Uh, it's kind of a unique movie. I can't think of any other movie like it. And just let's talk about the other cast members too. To really capture how psychotic he is. Um, what's that fucking guy's name? He plays. Timothy Bryce in the movie, which is Timothy Price in the book, but he's the guy, um, with, the guy with the other 
business card. He no, that's Jared Leto. No. That's yeah, Paul Allen. Allen. You forget how many people oh, are actually okay. in okay. this. Yeah. The other guy I'm talking about, he is also. I can think of. Here's what you'll know him from right now. He's also in Parks and Rec as um, that guy that Anne is trying to save for her to, to self to date in like the second season. You okay. know that guy? He's yeah. in that movie. He's also a writer and director. Oh. And he's written some fucking God. What's his name? I'm gonna have to look it up while we're sitting here talking about we'll it. Look but. it up real quick. Oh, Justin Thoreau. Yes, Thur- Justin Thoreau. Thoreau. Yes. Thoreau. Yeah, he's he's in this, and he's incredible. Uh, let's see. What's um Reese Witherspoon? Yeah, I was gonna say there, Reese Witherspoon is great. Even she's just kind of like you overlook her being in there because you're just so distracted by everything else going on. And she's great in that too. I mean, because she's she plays a great socialite in that movie, but she's not completely yeah. fucking is like blonde and airheaded is like she became later known for in other roles but like so there's some real depth to the characters in this movie mm-hmm. uh willem dafoe kills it mm-hmm. holy shit willem dafoe in there man like he kills it in everything but goddamn, does he kill it in this too he's just creepy and menacing but uh, there's something about him in it that i just love between that role and the role he has in boondock saints like him being like those really creepy type of character, like he really like him. Yeah, he comes back for that really creepy type of motherfucker in uh, Grand Budapest. Mm-hmm. That yeah. shit is he's disturbing in that too. Yeah, obviously he's the main villain in the original Spider-Man with mm-hmm. Tobey Maguire, and then like the most lighthearted you ever see him is um, as a cripple and born on the Fourth of July. Just kidding, and that's no, really but, fucked up. No, but I mean, in uh, The Life Aquatic, he's about as mild-mannered as he gets. But he still still has a good role in there. Yeah, I think I saw a post on Facebook today. Somebody was talking about that, and Nathan was commenting about how he loved William Dafoe's role in that movie. And it is true, he's great. Oh, yeah. It's probably his most overlooked role. Klaus. Did you guys watch uh, Lighthouse yet? I have not seen that. I've heard good things about it, and I keep seeing the memes going around comparing, like, hey, 2020, I look like Klaus from... Yeah. Uh, Life Aquatic, and then I look like I'm in the lighthouse. That's like a movie you'd oh, think yeah, I would have already watched, but I haven't watched it yet. I just, it's been on my list, and I'm kind of saving it for when I don't feel so depressed. You know what I mean? That's like a movie you, you got to be ready for. I know that much because there's yeah, some fucked up shit I know in that movie. You can you it tell. It does give me a weird feeling. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Late for some spring to pass. And... So my number one. <laughs> oh yeah, we we still have to get to your number one. What is which it? we've already talked oh, about shit. is Lost in Translation. Okay. I figured okay. yours was uh, that had to be. It was. It was. I don't know if I'm going to put Lost in Translation or American Psycho first. You know, that's the whole debate I was having the whole time. But I just kind of figured. Well, I think this one's a little more positive, so I'll, I'll put that as my number one. Fair They're enough. both dark films, but for different reasons. So. Yeah, I mean, I can see that. I understand that. So we celebrate female or women directors, however you want to, however you want us to don't say, say that. Don't say female. Oh my God. Yeah, you, you do see how this might make us look bad, right? <laughs> I wish I could go back in time and add that to myself earlier. <laughs> um, so well, it's what not else? as bad, because when you said that, I thought you were saying she's the least attractive, so that would be the easiest one you could score. With. No, <laughs> no, no. So you sound a lot better after clarifying, I think. I mean, I don't think anybody would argue that point, but also... You should have just she called is, her, like, she's your kindred spirit or your spirit animal from that movie is that character, because that's who you found most relatable yeah. to. I guess so. Yeah. But childhood drama fucks with you people. <laughs> yeah, I guess that's true. So, you know, you're still working on dealing with that. I mean, really, you're, you're, once you have that kind of shit going on, you deal with that the rest of your life in one way or another, so. Yeah. All right, let's move on to uh, something a little more positive. What are, we, what are we doing this? What are we doing? What are, what are we, what are, what are, what are, what are, You know what I just watched? Me pulling a can off some morons fist. Return of the Jedi. Did you see Alien? When that uh, creature was in that guy's stomach? <gasps> oh my god. Oh my god. You ever seen that really old movie? <laughs> Empire Strikes Back? Jesus, Tony. Welcome to Retro Release Reviews. Leave it to Ferris Bueller to reference the movie we're covering right now. Exactly. Yeah. So when we thought of Movies for Women's Month. You know, 9 to 5 was great because we needed something that we hadn't seen, some of us, right? So that worked for Nick and I. And, uh, like, you really got to go to 
badass. We had to make sure that there was a movie that everyone had seen. Well, you got to go to a badass movie, right? And, and, and this, yeah, this is what we talked about. We didn't want to cover like bridesmaids because it's the typical bullshit <laughs> that everyone mentions when they mention women's movies. We didn't want to cover that for this. Yeah, and unfortunately, like this didn't show up. I mean, Sigourney Weaver. I mean, you know, it's the survivor, right? I mean, it's sci-fi horror, but it's still horror to some degree. So you're gonna get that whores, whores. That's what it sounds like you're saying. Yeah. But it's pretty badass, though. I mean, really, she defined she defined she defined heroes for women with this role. The way she fucking has the foresight to see that, like, hey, we should not be breaking quarantine. Why the fuck are we breaking quarantine with this? She knows what's going on. She's the sole survivor at the end. Yeah, and it then, didn't start out where like she's like this weak person either. No, you know, and they to, they never have anything like Sarah Connor where she had to learn to be a badass and yes, train for it and stuff. They already right. show that she's a competent person and sh- there's a reason she has the job she has because she's competent and able to do that job. And that's one of the most beautiful things about it is like we don't have to have a character transformation. She starts out the badass she ends as in this movie just because she's smart, intelligent and capable. And that's the fucking beauty never had of it, to kill right? Alien before. Mm-hmm. Um, there's no trope there where like, oh, we got to take a goth chick and make her pretty, or we got to take a, someone that's weak and scared and make them strong. And no, this mm-hmm. her character starts out. Ripley starts out as a total fucking badass. Ends as a badass. Mm-hmm. Takes care of business. And returns for all of the fucking sequels because that's what it is. You know what I mean? That's the movie. Yes. Yeah, not all of the, the I guess not movie. all of the current ones, you know, but I mean for like the next four movies or the next three, whatever. The four, she's in four alien movies, right? Yeah. One, two, three, Resurrection. Yep. And I, even after they kill her, they still bring her back in the clone. Yeah, that's what I'm saying, so. So this movie is just so amazing, right? When you start watching it, the only thing that really hasn't aged well, and it's fine, just is some of the technology in there because they're using state of the art technology for the sequencing of yeah. landing on the planet and all that. But every movie from this era has that, right? That's going through that. that. Lots of old cool. sci-fi movies do. I think it still looks cool though. It does. Oh, yeah. It doesn't still, take me out of it. It I'd still looks it. better than so many other sci-fi movies, even that were made a decade later. I think you're just talking about like specifically the computer stuff, because when you're on yes. like the spaceship scene, no, the spaceship, still looks better than anybody else's spaceship today. No, the, yeah, the, the set design is impeccable. Obviously, H.R. Geiger famously designed the alien in this movie. pa 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 penis Oh, that dude loved penises. Um, Jello Biafra from the Dead Kennedys has the uh, insert that Dead Kennedys got sued for distributing pornography to minors when they had a bunch of penis covers, penis drawings, oh. or penis images from H.R. Geiger collection that they put into one of their album inserts. <laughs> So, I mean, by that logic, Nirvana should have been sued for child pornography. Well, they had a, a whole sheet, like, on a vinyl record of fucking penises. Yeah, so. well, I mean, I stand by my statement, because that Nirvana album cover is just still fucked up and gross, and uh, yeah, makes I, me not want to listen to Nirvana, to be honest, so. Yeah, when I had, you know, the well, CD of that, I always had the booklet mind. folded, so that wasn't the cover, because that's yeah. just, un- in a, I don't like it. Well, exactly. I, I'm burnt out on Nirvana as well, so. Yeah. yeah. So. Um, this movie, the pacing in this is great, too, because you're actually telling a story, right? A lot of horror sci-fi tries to get the scares going almost immediately, or there's a bunch of bullshit going on up front, right? In this, you really have genuine story building sure. before you get to that, which I think is overlooked, and that's probably why this movie holds up so well still, is because it's well-written. Yeah. Like, you get character, you get to see these characters come out of hypersleep because of this is going on. Um, and the pacing's really well done. See, this is another one. This, this movie um, falls victim to one of the few things, like, people will tell you that, you know, their favorite Terminator movie is Terminator 2. They'll tell you their favorite Alien movie is Aliens. For me, I, I like Terminator and Alien better. And it's because they're more horror-related films as opposed yeah. to being action films. That does not mean I don't love... Aliens and Terminator 2 and think they're some of the best movies ever made also. Terminator 2 is arguably better than Aliens, though, probably. But still, I mean, uh, this first one is horror as opposed to action. 
and mm. it works so fucking well because it is just like a horror movie. They start individually picking off these motherfuckers one at a time. Yeah. Yes, it's, and it's, it's and it's outright terrifying the way you find out this alien is using the human host as a symbiote to actually grow, right? And then er- everything going on in that planet, just like oh man, like the way it, it's built up and. It's it's hard to beat, right? And I know a lot of people love aliens because it's full of action. There's lots of explosions, lots of alien killing. Like they go to this place specifically to fucking find these things and kill them, right? Mm-hmm. You know, and get their revenge, right? And this first movie just works so much better than that because there's so much ambiguity to like, how long has that guy been there dead? How long do those eggs last? Right? There's just something so eerie about that. Like, well, it's you like think there's no threat there based on how long that guy looks like he's been dead. There's a lot of mystery in this movie. That whole spaceship, the ring, that's later explored in Prometheus, and that mystery with the the fucking, whatever they call those people now, but like the big giant alien in the mask and everything. Mm-hmm. The in engineers. That, yeah, the engineers, exactly. Um, I was going to say something else about there, too. Go on, continue with what you are saying. Oh, uh, yeah, just the way it sets it up, right? I mean, you see this, like... you you wouldn't think there's a chance that those eggs would be viable after that long sitting there, right? Because that guy looks like he's been dead a while, right? They don't know any of this technology. It all looks so far-fetched, and it literally just looks like it's almost... It doesn't quite look ancient, but it just looks like it's been there a long time. Well, it's like when I watched this movie for the first time around, like... You know, I watched bits and pieces of these movies, but mostly Aliens is what... Mm-hmm. Mom, our mom loves the movie Aliens. So she I saw likes that the one first all the time. One too. Yeah, yeah. yeah. When I went back and watched, I mean, I saw Prometheus in theater with her because we were excited about it because we were both, like, I was in my teenage phase of discovering new films, and that's when I watched Alien again for the first time and, like, really started understanding and pay attention to actual details and plot things more than you do when you're a kid. You know what I'm saying, right? But Yeah. um, When, for example, Ash is revealed to be a fucking android, you're like, holy fuck! And that's just super fascinating, and it doesn't, hold the same weight when you bring back androids in a similar fashion in other movies as it does in this one. And he does great as that android and, like, his movements and, and creepiness, the effects, when he's headless and they bring it back to life. All that's just fucking just well, fascinating. Yeah, and you see, like, why he's lying through because he's got ul- he's got ulterior motives that mm, he wants yes. to he wants to st- study this and, and figure it out, right? Which, and, that's, a, like, an outlying thing throughout all of these alien movies. Eventually, like, they return to it in the Prometheus and all that shit where like the androids kind of subtly evil and doing some shit behind your back. Yeah, and I it works so well in this one because like, you know, it it, it just makes sense. And then there's like that one line of foreshadowing where um Ripley's talking to him and he says he's still computing or something like that or still calculating and I and I think he uses a different word. Mm. But he says that and she's like you're still what? And then he kind of repeats it and then he's like, "Well, I'm not going to tell you how to do your job, so just let me do my job. Yeah. And then she just kind of walks off. And you're like, okay. And then full circle, that line makes a lot more sense when you know, obviously, yeah. the, the entire story of the movie. Um, and it holds up really well. This movie, I just, it's hard to get tired of it because it's so well done. And then the cat, too. Like, once you start seeing the cats there, like, creeping and watching the alien kill and, like, the way they splice that in there, too, you're like, oh, man, it's so good. Yeah, I like that. Um. There's a, I also think it's great at the end that she actually goes looking for the cat, even though they're all about to die, and she needs to get the hell off the ship. Yeah. There's like, a... That's um, what I, there's, I would do that. There's like a myth around the chest bursting scene where it was just done in one take, and it shocked the people. Now, yeah. they did intentionally shock them with it by not telling them that they were going to use real animal guts and blood. Oh, yeah. So that's a little disappointing, although they probably likely got it from, like, a butcher shop or something like that, so it's not like they're out there slaughtering animals for this movie. They're just taking waste, but it's still pretty fucked up, and it traumatized the actors, like, legitimately. One of them specifically went home and, like, just wasn't even talking to his family for, like, a couple days. Yeah, well, if you're going to get something's real guts thrown all over you, yeah, like, that's... Sigourney Weaver talked about how it fucking smelled horribly and just made the set real fucked up, you know what I mean? Like... Yeah, and I, if you're trying to get a reaction out of people, that's one way to do it. But that's that also scene, a way to fucking, like, r- lose trust. And that scene does look disgusting, yeah, right? Because It's incredible. You have an initial burst, right, which everyone's like, oh, the chest burster, right? And it's like this whole thing in, in other movies where it bursts out more rapidly. Like in this one. he's it, That's what makes it more blood. violent is that he's, like, trying to actually yeah, trying to get through, right? Uh, it's fucking And then disgusting. when you look back and you see, like, the whole from the 
in the ship wreckage where the ribs are broken from something yeah. bursting out too. You're like, oh, okay, right? So there's a lot of foreshadowing that really sets the stage for these moments to become major later on. And a lot of that stuff you can't appreciate on the first viewing because you have no idea. Yeah. But when you go back and you're like, holy fuck, the editing on this, the way they tell the story, and that chest burst is disgusting. It's like fucking gross. It's one of the best horror scenes really ever. Not specifically that that scene in death. Um, and that is so scary. Like to me, even as a kid watching Spaceballs were Yeah. They yeah, I was gonna it. say Spaceballs has undercut it a little bit. But. Hello, but, my baby, hello, my baby. Hello, hello. Yeah, but it's still like in Spaceballs, it still grossed me out and like scared me as a little kid, just because like something ripping out of someone's chest. Yeah. I don't care that it sings show tunes. <laughs> the guy two even came later. back to do the same role in yeah. Spaceballs. Yeah. Exactly. And you, I never appreciated that until I went back and rewatched yeah. it. And you're like, oh fuck. Like, yes, that is yeah. so on point. Yeah. It's amazing. Because doesn't he say, like, oh, no, not again? Yeah. Yeah. It's oh, no. Thing. Not again. And, uh, yeah, that's, it's so, it's so good. Um, they wanted, there was originally some uh, casual sex written into this movie. They wanted a lot of casual sex between the space people because it's the future and stuff. Um, <laughs> so that was a thing for a while, which was later actually brought back for Prometheus, basically, when you have Charlize Theron, who's, like, hanging around, and Idris Elba's like, hey, if you want to jump on this fucking chocolate disco stick, you can do that. And then she does. Yeah. Yeah, they, they kind of have those things there, and, like, the... Uh, it works better without that, because that's just distracting stuff that doesn't carry the story. They had some reasoning for it, which I didn't write all of it down. There was a scene where it was sort of relevant, but it wasn't really, so they just worked around it and figured out a way not to do it. But originally, I think Dallas and Ripley had a sex scene. And then yeah. there was only mention... Oh, here's what it is. The two women, um, Ripley and... What's the other woman's name? I forget, because she's well underplayed in this movie, unfortunately. Yeah, even though she's one of the last survivors. Um, yeah. But they're talking about... In this theoretical scene that doesn't happen, they're talking about... Um, Oh, have you ever slept with Ash? That's how they were just determining that he must oh. be an android because neither of them have fucked him or whatever. Basically. I see. Okay. Yeah, that, and that would make sense to, to, from that point of storytelling. But yeah, it works completely well without that, and it's unnecessary, and it's totally fine. Oh, I just thought it was interesting. The, uh, they were going to make the casual sex kind of part of the story, though. Like, yeah. That's how they figured out he was... Okay. Yeah, yeah and that... From a that's cool, from a storytelling perspective, that would make sense, but it's it's unnecessary in this one. Yeah. So I could see why that's. Like I said, I I like that scene very much when all of a sudden Ash is trying to fucking kill Sigourney Weaver and shit, and you're like, holy shit, this, this is fucked up. And then mm -hmm. the, he grabs the other guy in the chest, and it almost looks like he's Kalima. Yeah, that's a good scene too, right? Because that's terrifying. Because then you have two villains in the movie, right? You have what you think is a human villain. It's utterly terrifying, and then you have the alien itself. So it works because it's multidimensional. Yeah. God, I miss really amazing storytelling, right? And that's not to say we don't have that now, because like we we do have good storytelling. But when you look at something like this, this is a movie I didn't appreciate mm -hmm. until like the last I don't know, you know, until I was an adult, really. I've been appreciated for for a while. I really like Ridley Scott and his um, movies. Some of them, anyway. I don't give a fuck about Gladiator. It's, it is what it is. You can like it. I don't think it's a bad movie, but I just don't give a fuck about Gladiators and any of that kind of shit. I don't like those kind of movies. So, yeah, yeah. So, this movie still holds up very well. And to your point, like this is, this is kind of that thing where the sequel a lot of people have better memories of, and right. And the other part of that I think is that it was on pay cable for so long, and then it was on you know, like the movie of the week and, and like that type of stuff. But I mean, when was Aliens? 1986? Yeah, like so, a full seven years later and then Alien 3 didn't come out until like 93, I think, or 93. Yeah, so, so you're looking at a long gap there. For So for a lot of people, there's nostalgia tied to the sequel without ever having seen the original, yeah. right? So that's another reason why I think that falls is to be some people's favorite. Same thing with Terminator, right? It's It falls in that timeline of you had more opportunity to see it than the original, so you have more nostalgic ties to it, when in fact the original one typically does have better storytelling. And it's fascinating that those movies are so far apart from their original counterparts, the sequels, because nowadays, when usually when they wait that long, it fucking is awful. Yes. You know, like, usually it's like, no, you gotta try to get it out quick if you want it to be good still. 
But like they took their fucking sweet ass time and were eventually just like, hey, you know what? Let's do a second one. And the thing with Aliens is that works because it's so different from the first one. They're not just retelling the same well, story. Well, yeah, that's the thing. It, it, the Paul Reiser's characters and him and Ripley interacting that whole movie is what makes it for me. Yes. It's uh, less of the... Again, I don't even... Like, the memorable stuff to me is not the action sequences in that. No. I can't even picture much of the action sequences except for the ending. But yeah. I can picture all the characters. I can picture Bill Paxton and fucking Michael Bain or Michael Bean, however you want to say that. Yeah. And that stands out now. Terminator 2 is more of a retelling, but it's obviously a much higher budget, and they, they change it yeah. enough that it's not a complete retelling, but it, it, it and is. And that is a, just a... That's one of those movies that's like Jurassic Park. It's fucking revolutionary with filmmaking in general. Not, not just storytelling, but just like actual filmmaking and how you're portraying shit on there. Like... The commentary for that, com- Terminator 2, have you ever watched that? That's one of the best commentaries ever. I highly recommend it because they're talking about, like, there's a helicopter shot. We're talking about Alien here, and I'm talking about Terminator 2, but yeah, how can but you it's- not? Because it's Terminator 2. This should be on the docket for every podcast. At the end of the episode, we talk about Terminator 2. Um, no, but there's, like, a really long helicopter shot where, like, I think the helicopter flew under like a fucking bridge or something crazy. They're talking about. I don't know. It's just very fascinating. You should watch it. Good. I uh, have to check that one out. Uh, the commentary that is obviously I've seen T two. So Nick, uh, what about Alien makes it stand out to you? Mm, trying to think of something you guys haven't said. For me, it's interesting, right? You know, the horror aspect of it. Definitely. I mean, there's a lot of sci-fi, but I get. To- because I love sci-fi and horror, so you put them together. Mm-hmm. Well, and the sci-fi aspect of it is like, it's just believable in the fact that, okay, you believe they're actually working on a mining operation and coming back carrying this load. So the stuff on the ship, like, you don't need to be, like, impressed by it. You just need to know that it feels like they're actually just people yeah, doing realistic. a job. They feel it's like they're doing a job. Fanciful, it's not fanciful future. Yeah, this is one of those things that... Um, it feels like a future that could happen. Movies from like 1978 to probably like 1995 did really well, or maybe even like 1998. I don't know. Where you have a group of characters and they're all very memorable, or at least most of them are. Um, yeah, characters aren't always so memorable. <laughs> like I don't know, if, you know, know if the actors or like no. let me just name off a few: Die Hard, The Abyss, Alien, um, even all the way up to things like Anaconda. We're like it's it's a group of five or six characters, but you you aren't just focused on one or two of them. You actually get to know and kind of understand all of them as their own specific characters, and they do it so well. And the the portrayals are great. Um, they don't we'll do a, a lot of movies to, like that anymore. Give yeah. a shout out to y- Yafet Kato too. I've always been a fan of his. Yeah, I'm trying so, to think of his character's name. So in um. Sigourney Weaver, obviously, you know, is a Ghostbusters-oriented podcast oftentimes. Mm-hmm. You know, a lot of people, like, just find her super attractive. I was such a little kid, like, I wasn't even paying attention to that. But you watch this movie, and you're like, oh, you can appreciate it, right? You see her down, like, into her underwear and all that stuff. And Again, National Women's uh, <laughs> Day <laughs> celebration, but she does look good in her underwear. So what can you say? Well, We're no, to celebrate mean, all of her positive the, qualities. It's the empowerment of that, but you know, you see that no, and you're agree, like, okay, and she's comfortable with that. And then uh, I just feel like if we make uh, statements that could be portrayed as something <laughs> stupid, I have to point it out on the podcast <laughs> yeah. ahead of time so that people who would point it out to us can fuck off to hell. So yeah, but I mean, I think that type of character empowered people now that are doing like um, any kind of. OnlyFans, Patreon type modeling where they're empowered to feel comfortable in their skin and doing that and making money from that and all that kind of stuff, right? Where people aren't ashamed to be, you know, what you traditionally might try to call sex workers or talk shit on that. It's like, um, no, if you are a poor. sex worker with an OnlyFans out there, I will portray the xenomorph in your Ripley photo shoot. I will do that for you. And that's actually, Hit me up. That's actually one of the things about the original Alien is that that was a person in a costume, whereas mm-hmm. in the second one, you know, they went really above and beyond with... They shot that first one with the intention of making it very much not look like a human in a suit. And they did a pretty good job with it. Yeah, well, there's so many shadows and things in there, yeah. And you, that guy only ever portrayed that alien. That's fucking it. Never did anything else. Nice. Weird. What did they do for it in the second one? 
Uh, there was, you know, obviously with the Queen Alien and all the other stuff, I think it was a lot more models and... I'm, not even, well, I'm like, sure there's still some suits, but I don't know for sure. Yeah, like, miniatures. Know the one was, kind of thing, miniatures and puppeteering, I think, was mostly the second one. Um, okay. Which, which works, I mean, because, I, I don't know, it's just so fucking good. It's just hard to, hard to say anything about that that, you know, people don't already know. Yeah. If you haven't watched it all the way through, watch it. It's really well done. Indeed. So what else do we got? Anything to wrap up with? Um, I don't think we got anything too crazy. Um, again, as a reminder, if you're listening to this on the audio feed on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, anywhere like that, if you feel like it, if you feel like it, you know we are doing a video podcast now. So every week when we record, you can look at our ugly fucking faces, or flick the old bean while you watch us. Um, whatever. I mean, you know, it's up to you. But you can watch us on our YouTube channel, YouTube.com/slash The Frog Bros. Um, we also have other videos, lots of toy reviews, stuff like that coming up. Be sure to follow all of our social medias, you know, Instagram, Spotify, oh, <laughs> Spotify list. Uh, what's it called? Um, some other shit. Help me plug some shit here. Twitter? Yeah, there you go. That's what I was trying to think our of. Twitter. <laughs> Twitter. Twitter, Twitter, Twitter. Yeah, follow our Twitch. We don't have a Twitch. No, but uh, that, I wouldn't. Say never on that. I mean, that might be something. There's a lot of games coming out. We might get into some of that stuff. So yeah, um, we could just record us playing the Marvel game. We could Marvel do some game. of that. What are you talking about? Ultimate Alliance. Thing. Oh yeah. No, I don't think we're gonna actually do a Twitch or anything like that. If we do, we are gonna probably do some video game streaming, but it'll probably just be to YouTube, just so we can try to collect all our audience in one place, as opposed to trying to split up and try to yeah. collect from different things. Because um, plenty yeah. of people do video game streaming on there, so. Again, follow us on our YouTube, Twitter, Instagram, all that fun stuff. And uh, Alec has been so kind to show up our to show up to throw up our personal uh, Instagram accounts as well. So if you want to follow us individually, you can find us there on the video. I'm at Mr. West Studios. Alec is at at Ecto Violence. So if you want to see some other shit, there's lots of nerdy stuff on there besides that. But we'll see you guys next week and gals. Hi. Frog These are my dinner guests. Frog brothers. Frog brothers. Frog brothers. These are my dinner guests. Frog brothers. Frog brothers. Frog brothers. These are my dinner guests. Frog brothers. Shut this off. Shut these all off.